opened and nobody is safe. Not even us. Just like Hannah Montana, you really do have the best of both worlds, Margaret. You don't perform and you get to ride off of the coattails of your more talented friend. That's funny, coming from a bitch who doesn't perform. In an abundance of caution, I think I'm going to be calling out of your next five shows for you. Well, at least I have shows to call out of. You're a professional roommate. And you're a failed drag musician. I'm the bomb. available on iTunes. Well, joke's on us. Because we're both the co-hosts of The Piss Stop! The winner of the least bad drag performer of this particular group receives $2,000 worth of drag swag from all over the DMV, a coveted spot in the least bad hall of fame, and a cash prize of over $3,000. Here are your extra special hosts of the Piss Stop. Season two winner, Jenny Nuclear and local socialite, Margaret Courtney Clisham. We That's right, welcome back to season two of The Piss Stop. And season one of the least bad drag performer of this particular group of all stars. AKA season four. This season we are joined by return competitors starting off with Lavender Menace of season two fame. Rosewood of season one fame. Blasphem of season two fame. And Monique Michaels, who did it first in season one. But we can't have a season of all stars without a twist. Each week, the top two all-stars will compete in a lip-sync battle for the win. The winning competitor will not only receive three extra points to their score, but an advantage in the next week's challenge. Get fucking queens! Because this is about to get real. For the first time in Piss Stop history, we are having a special guest on this week's episode. Hailing from season three of the least bad drag performer of this particular group, we are so excited to announce Diabetes will be joining us to read your hot takes and questions. Hi, Daya. How are you doing today? Hi, everyone. It's your current reigning runner up from Least Bad Season 3, Diabetes, here to answer your hot takes and your boiling questions that you've been holding in all week. To kick us off, our all-stars take a page out of the Drag Race book and start up the season with a roast, and it gets hot. Spicy. Let's get this roast to cooking. Disclaimer, the following video contains our biased and unbiased opinions. Drag is art and art is subjective. We are only responsible for our opinions if you agree with us. What we say may not be true, but it will always be honest. 60's Sweetheart has said, I wish there was a tablecloth on the table. Yeah, very true. We all know Chicky loves her gingham. She could have just taken some excess fabric and thrown that down. We would have been good. So first up tonight, we have Lavender Menace, which is very interesting because going into this, Lavender is very much known for like her splits and her tricks, but less so of kind of her drag character in the way of speaking on a microphone. So I'm sure she's in a position of being maybe a little bit scared, but I don't think that you could tell. She definitely was maybe a little nervous, but especially for opening, I think it was a really strong start. And out of everyone on the cast, Lavender is one of the nicest contestants. So hearing some of these roasts come out of their mouth is kind of like jarring at first, but I think Lavender chooses a really smart avenue that no one else took, which is doing a character and leaning into a bit that structures the format of the roast. So Lavender starts as sort of like a play on Katie Herring from Mean Girls and pulls out a burn book and claims that she doesn't know who wrote it. I think that that was a really smart choice from Lavender, especially if you are feeling a little bit nervous about speaking on the mic, giving yourself some kind of like parameters within the challenge can be a really helpful way to like remove yourself from the situation and really also work on character work. So I feel like this is a good experience for Lavender to really kind of broaden her skill set. And that being said, I mean, the audience was eating up a lot of her jokes. There was like really strong reactions. From the jump, a random audience member was like, 
like she doesn't even go here like just automatically right. like it's such a smart choice to choose something that people already know because mm-hmm. you know that they're already on your side exactly the audience is like already rooting for you and it's so recognizable plus with mean girls being back in the cultural zeitgeist of right now very smart choice oh yeah and it was really funny throughout the duration of the roast lavender included like little references to mean girls Mm -hmm. calling amber regina george talking about last making out with a hamburger and stuff like that just to like punch up the character it was a tasteful amount of mean girls exactly it wasn't copying tina fey exactly and like we that's a very beloved movie it's been out for a long time so you know you don't want to go too heavy-handed with it because it's like okay let's write your own jokes girl but she did not fall into that trap she was very clever with it and really like slid them in in unexpected ways lavender had the most scathing roasts of amber i know amber just so happened to do a regina george number that night so she's literally going head to head with lavender to the question who has the most scathing roast monique michaels asked what does that word mean cunt wasn't in the sentence so that just left her lost scathing means it's pretty cutthroat and pretty hot just like the sweat on your upper lip, mama. Not very congenial, Lavender Menace. Oh, oh, oh. Next up, we had Blast Femme, who was conveniently wearing lavender that evening. It was a convenient segue, but I feel like it was almost like giving lavender too much credit because then we did have someone from the audience call out, I think she's scared. And Daya, what do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> to the question who had the most scathing roast, Lycan Von Stagg has responded with, the person who called out Lass's nerves at the beginning of her roast. And it looks as though the mixed congeniality title has fled the building for now, because I will say for that to be a call out from the audience and not somebody on the panel was kind of crazy. One of Lass's jokes that I thought was so funny was how she was talking about Rose would be the first out, but unfortunately that would mean Monique would be in the finale. <laughs> Why him up and knock him dead, Blass? Exactly. <laughs> and that's the thing. One of the things about Blass's set was that I think a lot of the jokes, you could see like the joke in it, but the delivery kind of got messed up. Yeah. And then during critiques, Blass was talking about how she was had them all written out and they had to be said in a specific way, but then didn't want to read off the note cards and get read for reading. Mm -hmm. In a roast, even if you're reading, the amount of points you'll lose for reading directly off of a piece of paper versus memorizing it, but then kind of messing up and the jokes aren't funny anymore, it's probably better to just read it directly off the paper. Yeah, I think she definitely got in her head a bit, as she said, and unfortunately her jokes did suffer from that. I mean, knowing Blash, she has a very unique sense of humor that is, mm -hmm, it's very particular about wording. So it was unfortunate that happened because some of them felt a little bit too mean or like a little too out of pocket because I feel like the right setup wasn't there. And so hers did kind of end up being maybe the most awkward. 60s Sweetheart has also said, someone's roasts were a bit awkward at times, NGL. Just as awkward as the grammar in that sentence. But I agree, there were some awkward moments. The top two, I think, were the clear front runners for the evening, which left following those two up really difficult and did make it a little bit awkward, especially when I was searching for Blast's lip the entire evening. That being said though, like for myself personally, Blast had a couple standout jokes like that one we were talking yeah. about before and also the one where she said that Chicky inspires her to be trans. Before she even said the punchline, I was like, that is so fucking funny. <laughs> that Chicky inspires anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Also, I just think it's unfortunate to have a heckler and then not know how to respond. Yeah, and then it's really, mm-hmm. it's just like uh, you're starting off on the wrong foot. And I'm sure it didn't help with her nerves as well. However, that dress was so beautiful. She looked really good. I can definitely see what the judges were saying about her makeup being too light. And I think that as a beauty advisor, she could be advised a bit, just especially when it comes to that harsh stage lighting. Like they said, it's like, I know she likes that kind of like light pastel Y2K style look. In the close up pictures, it's giving like a soft glamor that was really yeah, nice, yeah. but it just was too washed out. And I want to see her fucking face. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I'm sitting in the back. I want to see what you look like and I want you to look good. Yeah. Blast has a good foundation for mm-hmm. like- Signature, signature For like a mug. signature look. It just has the, I think the values just have to be pushed. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's one thing. She may have went to art school, but it was her costuming. <laughs> Crafty queen, derogatory. <laughs> Speaking of which, shall we move on to Monique Michaels? Yeah, who did it third today. <laughs> <laughs> so Monique comes on the mic following two fairly soft-spoken people 
booming on that thing. She is so confident and like, the Monique character is so lovable. She had the audience on her side. They were cheering for her down. They were so excited to see her get on that mic. Monique Michaels took a page out of the Sylvia Sterling school of getting people to show up to the competition that you're competing in. Yeah. Because I think that half the people there were there for Monique. The audience reaction just made it feel so much more like grand. Like it's like, okay, it is a bit of an advantage to have the audience on your side because it just makes you feel like she's doing better. Not that, I mean, she did right. But there there was a lot of contention about was Lavender's better? Was Monique's better? And I think that like having that really strong audience reaction may have swayed some people into thinking that Monique's was better, whereas other people saw through that and were like, oh, well, Lavender's jokes were more clever. Alea Armand says, Monique took a shit in the mother toilet. First of all, Alea, you weren't there. Second of all, this is the pissed off. So why are we talking about shitting? We need to be talking about the number one diva who is in fact Monique Michaels, who did really just shit in the mother toilet. Monique did reference the piss stop with her final joke for Amber, how to shut Amber up in three words. The piss stop! Which personally, I loved. I thought it was really funny. I think even funnier than that was the fact that maybe we might have been the only people cheering and laughing at it. <laughs> Whoa, woo, woo! Like, yeah! Oh. Piss, piss, piss! <laughs> And for everyone who doesn't know what that is, Chicky, Chicky, when you are on the mic, tell them about our show. And tell them to subscribe, please. Please, we will give you money. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, I don't have that much to say for Monique because famously I wrote a lot of her jokes. Um, but I know she was really nervous going into this and I think that she was nervous because she knows that there's a lot on the line for her, but like she really just had to be herself because like we said, she's so likable, she's so fun to watch and I'm really glad that it paid off for her. And it's really kind of bringing one of our first storylines of this season to a head where it's like, are these queens, as they repeat the challenges that they've done before, going to be able to rise to the occasion and overcome their past failures or are they gonna flop again? And tonight, Monique did not. Monique did not. Interestingly though, Rosewood won the roast challenge from season one. And for a lot of people did not live up to those great expectations that we had. I remember where I was when Rosewood took the mic and we all went, oh, did not come to play. Did not come to play. I remember I Rose taking that mic and just thinking, holy shit, she just took them all out. Well, personally, I felt a little attacked. I will say she may have knocked me out, but I will just say, even though I have been taking a little bit of break from the scene, the bitches cannot keep my name out of their fucking mouths. <laughs> but yeah, I think that this week, I wish that some of the jokes had been rehearsed more because mm. I think that a lot of the jokes were solid, but there was just like some uneasiness about the delivery that kind of made some of them fall flat. But when you thought about it, it was like, oh, that's a really good joke. You just didn't go all the way. Mm -hmm. But then there were some that I was like, oh my God. I was yeah. like, she was coming for everyone. <laughs> she was really kind of the only one who was like, shooting shots into the crowd like yeah. no one was safe but i will say that to me a lot of the jokes felt maybe just a little bit too niche like maybe she thought about them too much and was trying to like dig up some dirt that maybe not everyone was privy to which, which is really hard it's really hard it's a really hard part of this challenge the people that you're talking about all this stuff with are all probably drag queens so to make jokes that everyone who isn't neck deep in the local richmond drag scene drama can laugh at Sometimes that's the challenge in itself. Mm -hmm. Which, funny enough, um, Amber St. Lexington in the beatdown actually said that for her, Rose's set was lacking because Rose isn't a queen who like gets out a ton. And she was like, we're abbreviating here, but if you don't like go out into the scene as much, it's gonna be harder to like pull the, that kind of humor and know what's up. But still though, in my opinion, a lot of it was niche. Um, although I will say that when she compared Blass's drag to a cockroach and then called it crunchy, the only thing I could think about was eating a cockroach. And I was like, ew. That means it's a good it roast. It means it's a good roast because I was like, roast. I was affected. Yeah. I felt it. And then you look at Blast and you're like, 
You're like, yeah, she would eat a cockroach. <laughs> also, my other note that I took during the roast was that watching the background, I think that I can definitively say that Monique and Rose are the most entertaining to watch when receiving roasts. They have really yeah. good reactions. Yeah. They're really funny. And they also look really pretty. And I feel like Rose did what not a lot of people were willing to do, which was while other people were doing their sets, if they took a shot at her, she had something to say. Right, she clapped which back. Which I was like, good. Yeah, as you should. It's mm -hmm. your, like, it's your honor that you're defending. Mm -hmm. And I feel like probably they're mostly graded on their actual sets, but just in terms of like revving that energy up yeah. and like showing that you have teeth in the competition. I see you, girl. Overall, I think with the roast, there wasn't too much joke overlap, which I was really happy about, because sometimes with the roast, people can really like cling on to someone's signature characteristics. Some things might start to feel a little bit cliche. I will say with Ember, there was definitely some repeats, but that's because it's really easy to make fun of Ember St. Lexington. I was worried that a lot of like the same jokes that we've kind of heard from season one would be repeated, like yeah. stuff about Chicky, but Lucky for us, Chicky Parm always invents new and interesting ways for us to make fun of her. She's a real one for that. Thank you, Chicky Parm. Theatricality from Atlanta, Georgia says, four seasons in and Chicky's still butchering runway descriptions. Can't teach an old dog new tricks. And it's not like anybody could butcher anything else more than Amber did on the beat out this week. <laughs> Girl, if you're just attending the show and watching the piss stop, you're only getting two thirds of the story. Amber St. Lexington says, Blast paint's too light. Sixty Sweetheart says, They don't make those colors in crayons. Amber St. Lexington says, Blast is part of the new generation of drag. Jenny Nuclear says, New generation, derogatory. Aren't you a part of it too? Amber says, Blast Femme's stone down Fashion Nova was neon and fish. Chicky Parm says, neon and future. Diabetes says, neon and futuristic. Venetian says, neon and future. And Mix Lavender Menace says, neon and future. Veronica May Monroe says, Amber, you suck. Amber says, Lavender Menace should have had a staff for her fish warrior look. Sixty Sweetheart says, a cake pop staff. Throwback! Amber says, Madam West. Everyone says, May. May. And finally, Amber St. Lexington says, Hello, this is Officer Quinn. And, and that's, that's what you missed on The Beatdown. Theatricality phoning in from Atlanta, Georgia, has said, I think LB should have waited a season or two for All Stars. A lot of people ask me why I personally didn't do All Stars. And for me, it was just a little bit too soon. And I think that was similar feeling that a lot of season three had when we did get asked, would we compete? Had we waited a season in between season three wrapping and going into All Stars, I personally would have competed. Next, we move on to the runway category for the evening. The theme for this week was a combination of two past runway themes. They could choose anything from seasons one through three, two runways mashed together. Margaret, tell us about what you're wearing this evening. This week, I wanted to honor season one's futuristic runway and season one's favorite body part runway, which is obviously my eyes. For me personally, not only did I want to honor the seasons of Least Bad by wearing archival, original garments seen on the Least Bad runway, featured in season one's Under the Sea, worn by Theatricality, I'm repping that diva, love you sister, and representing season two, worn by myself, Jenny Nuclear, I'm wearing my iconic marching band hat and my iconic yellow bob. And you might be asking, why these two runway choices together? Well, I thought in classic pissed off tradition, I should wear something really fucked up for the first episode. And there you have it, folks. Daya, what about you? So for my personal take on this week's runway, I'm going for neon and future drag in this lovely leather Abraham Levy corset, showing these divas just how hot of a piss take I am in yellow. Thanks, Daya. And speaking of Daya, Chicky Parm's look was actually constructed by that diva, you go. Inspired by two iconic season two runways, black and white and feathers. Rosie Revenge has responded with, Chicky Parm has returned to her chicken roots by dressing as a silky hen. She is the cosplay queen of Richmond after all, so she was gonna give us a cosplay look sooner or later this season. Y'all said, said it best. best. Up on the stage first, we have contestant number one, Lavender Menace. 
In a mashup of Under the Sea and Feathers, Lavender is a lionfish warrior ready to destroy your reefs. Drawing inspiration from comic books and the vibrant colors of tropical fish and birds, Lavender is ready for a battle on the ocean floor. Pheasant feathers were transformed to fins by Neve Coppersmith to resemble the spikes of a lionfish in the mohawk and tail. With shoes rhinestoned by Margaret Courtney Clisham, Lavender Menace is floating down the runway in a poisonous tail feathers and rhinestone scales. There's a battle on the ocean floor. So you, you better, better not be a fish. fish. I think that this look was hands down the best look of the night. That bodysuit had no spot left on stone, courtesy of Lavender Menace. You can tell that a lot of work was put into this look, and a lot of time was spent thinking about the concept of it. Which, interestingly enough, Lavender shared on her story that originally the look was meant to be under the sea and futuristic. Once their collaborator, Neve Coppersmith, introduced the feathers idea, they then decided that it overall read more feathers, and that was a strong choice which I think really paid off and Chicky made note of that on the mic as well that it was one of the coolest combinations. I agree because all of the other runways were a color and a theme combined but this one was two distinct themes that also do not go together. Right you that wouldn't think to combine scene. them. Well you would. <laughs> <laughs> we're actually not allowed to match up more than two runways so yeah, I would like for you to nice. not address the feathers. Place. Those feathers were such a smart like incorporation to really get the vibe of fish. I love the way that the silhouette was transformed with the feathers kind of on the hips coming out. It really gave fins. The way that they moved was like, it was definitely floating, ethereal. And then the mohawk, which is super badass too, also really giving warrior. I think that this look was really strong from the jump. And I think that it's a testament to what good preparation can do for you. Absolutely, and good preparation and also adapting because mm -hmm. if Lavender had continued with her original idea, who knows, it might not have read as well, but I think that being able to look at the progress that you've made, look and see how your concept has transformed over the course of making it and make that decision is very smart and is a great skill to have in this competition because things like that matter. Hands down. Hands so down. It was, it was very beloved. When we asked the people who their favorite runway was, again, vast majority had Lavender Menace, as you'll see with this chart right here. So, kudos. Anonymous said, Lavender's runway was the best one. It's giving David Bowie fish. You know, in the Lord's year of 2024, I don't know why we're using fish to describe drag anymore, Diva. Victoria Scon's gonna fly over from the UK and have it out with you. But also, boots. Coming up next on the runway, we have contestant number two, Blast Femme. This week, Blast is taking us to the neon future. In this future, the planet is ruled by neon pink plasma ball alien bitches. Plasma is more than just a queen on season 16. It's also a state of matter. Shocking, ain't it? Off the jump, I love this combination of futuristic and neon to make yourself into one of those like touching like plasma mm -hmm. ball things. Mm -hmm. I, I'm like, only Blast Femme would think of this. I think that that is like, a really inventive way to take kind of like an obvious pair up. Um, That's true. But I think that this look would have benefited from a more thought out presentation on the runway because she came out touching the helmet already, but it kind of gave the um, effect that like the helmet was going to like fall off or that it wasn't super secure, mm -hmm. but it, it can stand on its own. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe like thinking about when you want to reveal gags that are in your outfit um, is something that could be really beneficial. Which also then it was a bit of her downfall too, because by the time she got to the stage, she started having magnet malfunctions. And so <laughs> the like tentacle pieces started falling down and then you couldn't even see the full effect of them touching the, the sphere. And so it unfortunately was a bit of a flop, even though I do think it was a really fun concept. It's really hard to recreate with fabric and craft materials that kind of neon electric effect from like a plasma ball. So I do think that it was quite the undertaking and unfortunately it did fall a little bit short. I mean, we know and love Blast. She's she's going to the mall, she's getting her stone down Fashion Nova. So it's a lot of pieces put together, but when you're trying to imitate like an object or an element, I wanna see more than just clothes that have been altered. I wanna see 
like a whole nuke and I think it could have been done a bit more effectively. I mean, for one thing, she stoned her, her Fashion Nova dress. Beautifully, by Beautifully, the way. and it was so Very stoned beautiful. down, but then the rest of her costume besides the plasma ball didn't have any other rhinestones. And so, especially when you're going for something that's glowing, something that's neon, if you're having shine and sparkle in your outfit, it should be consistent. And I think that bringing some stones onto those pink lightning bolts on the sleeves would have really elevated that, made that more visible. For doing it on the pink morph suit underneath, again could have just really bumped it up and so the whole thing was shiny and then at the very least you're getting that kind of like sparkly electric feeling yeah and then i think another element of the runway was the ball started like fogging up a hot take we received from lichen von stag says i was worried glass couldn't breathe in that helmet and you know it's not like her brain function could get any lower from that lack of oxygen but I was worried too, especially because it started to fog up. Like, it was really hot in it the was panel too. Really, really hot. hot. An anti-fog spray to go on the inside could be something that in the future could make this look wearable like in another setting. Mm -hmm. Because I do think that this is a look I'd love to see again. Oh yeah. I'd love to see like what kind of number Blast Femme can concoct to like mm -hmm. bring this to life. It's like because the plastic you really can see like the fingerprints and especially in an object where you're touching it a lot. Like it's just kind of bound to happen. I think that it's just like a hard situation because it's not the kind of garment piece that you can just quickly put on like right before you walk so that you can avoid the fogging because you have to also like set up the magnets. Yes. In the picture, it's kind of interesting because I feel like you can see the fog in it, but I think it that cool. it makes it look really cool in the picture. Like because of the way that it's photographed, right. it actually amplifies like the neon effect and yeah. it kind of gives it that like futuristic mm -hmm. plasma ball feeling. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting how something that's a downfall in person actually amps it up in a photo. Totally. Hey, good photo <laughs> shoot look. Never hurt anybody. And next up to the stage, we have Monique Michaels, who did a futuristic and black and white look. So kind of like Lost Femme's evil twin. Prepare for landing in three, two, one. Greetings, Earthlings. Monique is strutting down the runway, ready to take out her competition. Her black and white couture is giving space age realness, an homage to her iconic futuristic runway from season one. Watch out, girls. Monique has a gun and she's not afraid to use it. Pew Pew, special thank you to Botox, Gems by Genesis, Hats by Carlos, and Ace Props. I think on the runway, this look was super impactful and looked really good. I mean, it's hard to go wrong with like a really graphic black and white look and it definitely was giving space age. I think that she went for like a classic kind of like futuristic feel. The wig looked really gorgeous. That handgun piece was really beautiful as well and was a great self-referential moment to her classic pew pew gun. But as they did say in the critiques, there was a lot of it issues happening with the suit, especially with it being a material like vinyl under the stage lights, you can really see the ways that that is not complementing the figure, but in fact, kind of working against it. It's a really challenging material to work with. Definitely. What I have written down is which version of an Abraham David Levy corset, because unfortunately I just feel like it had those elements, those big hip pads, the big shoulders, but it just lacked a little bit of that polish. Mm -hmm. And it's like vinyl is just like a really difficult fabric. Right. So if you can't like knock that kind of stuff down, it's like the flaws are going to be pretty obvious. Exactly. And I know she was inspired by Abraham David Levy. And so unfortunately, because we've seen his work on the least bad stage a couple of times, it was just kind of fell short in comparison. I do think that this look has a lot of potential and like she, clearly she could move in it when she was doing the dance number. So like with a few maybe alterations, it could work out for her in the future. And like I said, it had a great impact. People were loving it. It was definitely, I think at a glance, one of the stronger looks of the night. Yeah, I think that also a lot of that impact came from Monique's modeling. Yes. Because from the jump, it was like, oh, this is Monique coming back, leaning into the branding and going into an iconic moment from her season. Monique, she just has that stage presence and not to get too real, but bring some of that into your dancing mama. I, I know you, I'm looking at you, Monique Michaels. You stare up into space. Show us your face, your character when you're dancing in drag. This is a side note. I'm just, I support you girl. <laughs>
Something else that I noted was the use of the prop gun, kind of like also leveling up the dinky little <laughs> like party city toy from mm -hmm. season one and turning it into like a full arm cannon blaster. Mm -hmm. I think that that was a really smart choice. At first, I didn't know how I felt about it being the only thing that was rhinestone, right? But I was like thinking about it, I was like, well, this is like the highlight of the look is this gun that I'm like, yeah, and you're you know? moving it around, it's getting a lot of glimmer. Yeah, yeah I think it looks it's really like nice. Store. I definitely felt it being the only rhinestone piece. Could have been cool if maybe her shoes were rhinestone, maybe a little couple of rhinestones in the hair could have been nice as well, just kind of keep yeah. it through. But it was a really nice piece. Fun fact about that, it's actually a recreation of a Samus prop. She customized it by painting it to give it a black and white feel and to maybe kind of remove it from that context. Thank you very much to the cosplay creators out there for bringing this wonderful technology to us. But it came with a little stand, and so that baby's going up right on her mantle next to her dinky little gun from season one. And finally, up to the stage, we have Rose Wood. Is that a gun in your pocket, or are you just happy to see me? Rose chose to combine the black and white and Hollywood runway. What better way to do it than in an outfit inspired by one of Mae West's iconic looks? Covered in velvet, rabbit fur, fake obviously because we're still a vegetarian, and hundreds of rhinestones, Rose is ready to annihilate the competition with elegance, grace, and a little bit of sass. Remember, a man's kiss is his signature. So pucker up, big boy. Here comes Rose. Quite the description for maybe a little bit of a underwhelming runway. It's very beautiful, it's very elegant, it is all of those things, but it is just on the more basic side. I think that I would have loved it, you know, on the Hollywood week last season to have seen something like this would have been really nice. Um, but for All Stars, just not quite hitting the mark. Even just hundreds of stones, Mama, I want to see thousands. Thousands come in the packs. I love certain elements of this, especially the fascinator in the wig and the yes. stones that were scattered throughout the hair. I think it gave it that like airy, sort of very elegant old Hollywood vibe. But honestly, I wish that just some stones had been scattered throughout the entire garment. It just like absorbs any light. Like it, it it's like a black hole, you know what I mean? Like it's not really giving anything on the runway because it becomes so flat. One thing that I enjoyed was the skull. However, I wish that it had been done bigger. I think that maybe like looking on eBay to see if you can find some sort of like fur second hand could have like been an option. Right. I'm not really sure. I don't know what the second hand fur market looks like nowadays. <laughs> you don't have to necessarily buy rabbit fur at full price um, or even real rabbit fur for that matter for it to look expensive. To me, it was giving kind of like blanket vibe more so than, yeah. than luxury. But it was very clean. Yes. It was a very clean fitted garment and Rosewood did not take a page out of Diabetes school of walking on stage and chose to make a dress that was a floor length gown with stretch fabric so she could move in it. She could move in it and she did move very elegantly. Her presentation was lovely, took her time modeling, really played up her prop. I loved the small detail of the red rhinestones on the cigarette mm. in the cigarette holder. I thought that was really, really clever. Black and white and red just a little bit. And I think that Rose has a really sexy walk and really played up those elements to give that like Mae West Hollywood yeah. character. Yeah, her energy matched the description very well. Definitely. Yeah, I would love to see some more creative looks from Rosewood in the future, but all over I mean, solid week. Dried Daisy Bunches says, Jojo Siwa is the Gen Z equivalent of Ellen DeGeneres. And you know, here lately, she's been just as polarizing. You know, Ellen's career ended with a simple, no, Ellen, you were invited. And Jojo Siwa's career has ended with, I was a bad girl. When she's still driving around in a car with her face all over it. But you know, I could see Monique Michaels doing the same thing because Monique's kind. In conclusion for the evening, after hearing the judges' critiques, we find out that the top two for this week are Lavender Menace and Monique Michaels. Congratulations, divas! And in the bottom two, we have Rosewood and Blast Femme. But with the All-Stars twist, Monique and Lavender will be lip-syncing against each other, revisiting their mixed Manchester rivalry. Will Monique take home the win again? The answer is yes, Monique did end up winning a lip sync to the Disco Inferno lead version against Lavender Venice. In quite a controversial turn of events, the judges were almost split with the decision and many of the crowd, as you'll see in this poll, almost split 50-50 between who truly won the lip sync. I think that it really might just come down to personal taste, might come down to who saw what, what you were paying attention to, because they did both serve. They are both very talented lip syncers. Haslet Duh said, I think the audience swayed the decision. 
Lavender had the best roast and runway look. However, considering it is a lip sync for the win, if you don't win the lip sync, you don't get the win. Personally, as a drag performer, as somebody who's competed, I think Lavender did win the evening. I agree with that statement. However, when it came to the lip sync, Monique really came out there and did the quintessential things that are needed for a number like Disco Inferno. With Lavender, when they really needed to amp it up, that's when they decided to slow down and start taking tips, and that's when Monique went full throttle. So, while I agree with part of that statement, and it is quite the hot take, we're just gonna have to see. Monique spent a lot of the time on stage, she looked really good up there, doing her little bits and then slowly building the energy, whereas Lavender was kind of in the crowd, working it from the jump, had her plan fit with the burn book, very clever, burn baby burn. So overall, it was so entertaining. I got pumped up watching that. It was a great way to finish the week. BB Gun says, Lav won that whole challenge. Kinda shitty, she lost to Just Dance Revolution. Very hot boiling piss take there, Diva. However, would love to see you go up in a lip sync against either of them and see just how well you do. Maybe we should hold our weapons down. Shouldn't we, Miss Gun? And with that, Monique earns an extra three points and she gets a little bit of an advantage in next week's challenge, which is a recreation of season two's Around the World Challenge. Woohoo! Contestants are able to choose their own country to represent with a lip sync from that country. Could be just an artist, could be something cultural. It's really up to the performer. It just has to be someone who is not American. But the twist is that Monique Michaels gets to choose one of her opponent's country for the week. And she made a choice. She certainly made a choice. Moni picked Rosewood and gave her the country Poland, which I guess was just the first country that Monique could think of. Unfortunately, our friend Monique is not very literate and had to Google what a country was. Interesting play though, because I would say at this point, Lavender has established herself as a front runner. So if I were up there, I might be trying to sabotage my sister a little bit. Mm -hmm. We'll see how all of this plays out on the stage next week. And on the runway, we learned that the theme is going to be Whore Couture. Can't wait to see what these sluts bring out for us. It's sure to be a very entertaining week. And with that, let the music play! Hashtag the piss stop. Oh mon dieu, c'est finalement pour le premier semaine du le moins mauvais drag performer de cette petite monde de tous les stars. Retournez-vous pour le deuxième épisode de La Réalité de Pisse! Et pour le prochain challenge, euh, cette performance performée tous les mondes. Et le couteau theme est couteau putain. Oh, Regardez-vous mes histoires pour les questions, les textes chaudes et plou 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 plou. Et bonne chance et do not fuck it up. Merci beaucoup pour regarder. Bisous. Bisous. Oh la la. It's me, Monique, on the beat, Jenny and Margaret on the tube, get it started on, pop a squat, it's a motherfucking piss, piss, stop, 8 o'clock, it's a motherfucking must, must watch, get the scoop, get the tea, watch the girls kick rocks, as we find ourselves a winner in the least bad spot, here's a reason for the season, it's a sick in this way, we are ready to play, all the jiggies, little games, holla fame, ain't no joke, it's more about the show, go tight, can't breathe, cause you're stepping on your throat. Lavender was first to sashay away Blast is a roach with a burger per se Rose's redemption took her all the way But it all comes down to points on the end of final day Ready? Independent Slay Sisters We are Oh my god, you guys, that was so kind <laughs>